Patricia Ann Stichler graced the world with her presence on June 5, 1954, in Toledo, Ohio. Affectionately known as Patty by her family and friends, she navigated life with resilience. In 1985, following a divorce the previous year, the 30-year-old Patty was a devoted mother to three daughters, residing on the serene 5,000 block of Brent Haven Road in Sylvania, Ohio. At that time, her eldest, Andrea, was 11, her middle child, Kristen, was nine, and the youngest was a mere five years old. Their upbringing unfolded in a neighborhood deemed safe and nurturing. Patricia made history as the first female manager of the 21st century health spas, dedicating over seven years to her role. On a fateful New Year's Eve, after tucking her daughters into bed post-dinner, Patty received a series of unsettling phone calls, each one ending abruptly as she answered. The following morning, Andrea awoke to a chilling reality. Her mother was missing. Venturing into the hallway, she stumbled upon a harrowing sight. Her mother's lifeless form sprawled on the floor, surrounded by a pool of blood, mostly unclothed. In a state of panic, she reached out to her father, who promptly contacted the authorities. Upon their arrival, the police discovered the brutal aftermath of the attack. Patty's throat had been savagely slashed, accompanied by numerous other injuries. Despite thorough investigations, no signs of forced entry were evident on doors or windows. However, knife marks were found on the shower curtain and window treatments in the bathroom, where an open window hinted at a possible entry point. Blood spatter adorned the walls of two separate rooms, with additional traces found on the bed and carpets. A DNA sample was meticulously collected from the scene. Perhaps the most chilling aspect of this tragedy was that while Patty endured the horrific assault, her three daughters slept just mere feet away, untouched by the violence. An autopsy revealed that the brave young woman had fought valiantly, sustaining wounds to her hands and arms, yet she was ultimately overpowered by her assailant, who inflicted a total of 19 stab wounds, with some inflicted post-mortem to her abdomen. Investigators suspect that the assailant gained entry into the residence through the bathroom window, it is believed that Patty was under surveillance before the attack, yet it remains unclear whether the perpetrator had any prior acquaintance with her. A male DNA profile, yet to be identified, was extracted from the evidence gathered at the crime scene. Both Patricia's former husband and her then-boyfriend underwent thorough scrutiny but were quickly exonerated in the early stages of the investigation. Patricia's daughters vowed to exhaust every avenue in their quest for justice for their mother. Over the years, they collaborated closely with investigators, even as the case grew cold after the first year following the tragic murder. Andrea, burdened by the trauma of discovering her mother in such a horrific state, has no recollection of that dreadful day. When Rich Schnorr assumed the role of chief of the Sylvania City Police Department, he made it his mission to prioritize the Patricia Stichler case, the sole unsolved homicide in the city. Among the three homicides that transpired in the area, the other two were resolved swiftly. In 2018, a genetic genealogist meticulously constructed a family tree from the long-preserved DNA, identifying distant relatives that ultimately led to a biological mother. This mother had placed the suspect for adoption, necessitating further tracing. Ultimately, their relentless efforts bore fruit, revealing the suspect to be Michael Mellis. At the time of the murder, Michael was merely 17 years old and resided just six houses away from Patty. Following his high school graduation, he enlisted in the army, while both his family and Patty's departed the community shortly after the tragedy. Despite their proximity, investigators had never considered him a suspect in Patty's murder. The revelation left Patricia's family in disbelief, finally granting them the closure they had yearned for over the decades. While the anguish endured by Patty's daughters remains profound, they now possess the knowledge of who so cruelly took their mother from them after 37 agonizing years of uncertainty. The situation was tinged with a sense of bitter sweetness, for Michael eluded the grasp of justice. In 1989, merely four years following Patty's tragic demise, Michael met his end in a solitary car accident while serving in North Carolina. Nevertheless, Patty's middle daughter, Kristen, now 46, finds solace in the knowledge of her mother's killer's identity. 
reassured that he can inflict no further harm upon anyone. Freddie Farah, a devoted 34-year-old husband to his beloved wife Nadia and a caring father to their four young children, was the proud owner of the Grand Park Food Store located on Kings Road in Jacksonville, Florida. On the fateful afternoon of May 22, 1974, at approximately 2 p.m., a tall, slender young African-American man entered the store and inquired about the location of the frosting. Freddie graciously directed him to the aisle. After selecting a few items, the young man approached the register, placing a box of cake mix, a can of frosting, and an open soda can on the counter. He then asked for the total cost of his purchases. In a shocking turn of events, instead of completing the transaction, he brandished a firearm, aiming it directly at Freddy's head, and demanded cash. In a moment of desperation, Freddy raised his hands, but the gun discharged, tragically striking him in the head. He succumbed to his injuries, while the assailant fled the scene without taking any money from the register. At the time of this horrific incident, Freddie's children were merely 11, 8, 6, and 5 years old. The details surrounding this tragic murder are largely known due to the presence of a witness, 14-year-old Annette Bryant, who was in the store that day. Although fingerprints were discovered on the items left behind, no matches were found in 1974. Despite the evidence and eyewitness account, the case went cold for over four decades. In 1998, the fingerprints were re-examined using the automated fingerprint identification system, but still yielded no results. It wasn't until 2016 that a breakthrough occurred. The fingerprints were analyzed once more, revealing a match. Two fingerprints from the can of frosting, one from the cake mix box, and a palm print on the soda can all belonged to a 59-year-old man named Johnny Miller, who was just 17 at the time of Freddie's tragic murder. Following the incident, Miller relocated to New Orleans, where he became a well-known street performer in the French Quarter, known affectionately as Uncle Louis. His fingerprints are cataloged due to several arrests for minor infractions. Prior to engaging with Miller, investigators took the initiative to re-interview Annette Bryant, who was then known as Annette Bryant Williams. Ensuring her recollection of the events from that fateful day in 1974 was vivid enough for her to testify. Her memory of the crime remained remarkably detailed. Detectives journeyed to New Orleans to question Miller, who vehemently denied any connection to Freddie's murder and claimed he had no recollection of ever entering his store. Nevertheless, he was apprehended on May 16, 2017, and returned to Florida. On July 26, he garnered support from both locals and tourists in New Orleans who had encountered him in the French Quarter, raising $6,000 to assist with his legal expenses. On August 15, a grand jury in Duval County indicted him on a charge of first-degree murder. A deposition for Annette Bryant Williams was arranged for January 18, 2018, as part of the trial preparations for Miller. Tragically, she passed away unexpectedly in December 2017 at the age of 58. In her absence, the case against Miller nearly unraveled. While prosecutors could still present fingerprint evidence, only Annette's testimony could have linked the items found on the counter to Freddie's killer. Consequently, a plea deal was offered to Miller, which received the approval of Freddie's family. If he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, he would be released, serving only the time he had already spent in custody awaiting trial. However, a significant condition of this agreement was that Miller would meet with the Farah family and answer all their questions about the crime with complete honesty. On April 20, 2018, Miller met with the family, revealing that he had known Freddie quite well, as he frequented the store regularly, sometimes multiple times a day. He shared anecdotes about Freddie's kindness, recounting how he would allow children to take snacks even when they fell short of the necessary funds. On the fateful day of the murder, he asserted that he had merely stumbled upon the firearm and intended to show it to Freddy. Upon reaching the counter, an overwhelming impulse to rob the establishment seized him. The weapon discharged inadvertently as Freddy attempted to push it away. In a state of panic, he fled, discarding the gun onto a passing train car. Throughout the meeting, 
Miller addressed every inquiry posed by the family. The Farah family found certain aspects of Miller's account compelling enough to believe in his sincerity. He expressed his remorse repeatedly during their conversation, leading the family to ultimately accept his apology. With this condition of the plea agreement fulfilled, the arrangement was solidified during a court session on April 25th, resulting in the release of 61-year-old Miller, who had served a mere 344 days for Freddie's murder. He returned to New Orleans, resuming his role as Uncle Louis, and continues to be a cherished figure within the community. Although the brief sentence fell short of the Farah family's expectations, they expressed gratitude for finally receiving answers to the lingering questions that had haunted them for over four decades. Am I upset that he is not spending more time? I would prefer him to provide the answers I have sought all my life rather than languishing in jail without resolution, remarked Bobby, Freddie's son, to the Florida Times Union. Nevertheless, Bobby remains resolute in his stance against any deviation from the plea agreement. Should Miller ever retract his confession, Bobby has pledged to journey to New Orleans and shadow Miller through the French Quarter, brandishing a sign that reads, This man killed my father. At the tender age of 18, Barbara Jean Jepson embarked on a new chapter of her life alongside her husband, Joe Jepson in a charming residence nestled in Van Nuys, California. With Joe serving in the National Guard and earning a respectable income, the couple eagerly anticipated expanding their family shortly after their nuptials. They exchanged vows in 1955, and by the end of that year, Barbara was expecting her first child. By January 1956, she was already four months into her pregnancy. On the seemingly ordinary day of January 31, 1956, Joe departed for work early in the morning, leaving Barbara feeling a bit restless at home. Seeking diversion, she ventured out for some shopping. Later that afternoon, around 12.30 p.m., she was spotted by locals before returning home. However, when Joe returned from work, he was met with a horrific sight in their bedroom. There, he found Barbara's lifeless body on the mattress, a 10-inch butcher's knife gruesomely embedded in her chest. In shock, Joe covered her with a blanket and promptly contacted the authorities. Upon their arrival, detectives uncovered a trove of evidence at the scene. A military green jacket, stained with blood, lay just a few feet from Barbara's body, while hair follicles belonging to an unidentified individual were discovered in the garage. Unfortunately, crucial pieces of evidence, including bed linens, pillowcases, and a bloodied rug found in the sink, were not collected due to the absence of DNA technology at the time. The autopsy revealed that Barbara had been murdered between 1 and 4 p.m., and it was determined that she had suffered sexual assault prior to her brutal stabbing. The crime scene exhibited no signs of forced entry, theft, or struggle, leading investigators to suspect that Barbara may have been acquainted with her assailant. During interviews with neighbors, two witnesses emerged. One reported seeing an unfamiliar individual in the vicinity that day, clad in a green jacket, while another described a man with notably large hands and knuckles. Barbara's tragic fate marked her as yet another victim in a disturbing pattern of sexual assaults plaguing the nearby community. Police interrogated every individual with a history of similar offenses in the vicinity, yet they could not establish a connection to the tragic murder of Barbara. Initially, suspicion fell upon her husband, Joe, but he was exonerated when it was confirmed that he was at work at the time of the crime. With no viable suspects, the detectives found themselves at an impasse. Despite years of meticulous examination of the evidence, the quest for Barbara's murderer remained unresolved, leaving her case in a state of neglect. In 2016, DNA analysis was conducted on various items retrieved from the crime scene. However, the samples were insufficient to be entered into the combined DNA index system for potential matches. Furthermore, it was likely that the perpetrator's DNA had never been recorded in the system. By 2019, Detective Rachel Evans of the Los Angeles Police Department joined the cold case unit, and her inaugural assignment was the case of Barbara Jepson. She embarked on a thorough re-evaluation of the leads, determined to uncover clues that had eluded investigators for six decades. 
It took her an entire week to peruse the case file for the first time, yet she found herself revisiting it repeatedly. By her third review, she discerned several overlooked details that previous detectives had dismissed. Notably, the absence of forced entry indicated that Barbara likely knew her assailant. The fact that no items were stolen suggested that robbery was not the motive. With the premise that Barbara was acquainted with her attacker, Evans began to assemble the puzzle, honing in on one individual, Monte Mers. Born in 1911 in Utah, Mers had a tumultuous romantic history, having married his first wife in 1931, with whom he had a son and a daughter before their union disintegrated. Following that, he entered into another marriage, which also ended in failure. In 1945, during the divorce proceedings, his second wife cited cruelty as a reason for their separation, a testament to Merz's violent nature. He was a man of many vices, an inveterate gambler, a notorious womanizer, a cruel tormentor of animals, and a volatile alcoholic, truly a portrait of moral decay. Yet, inexplicably, women continued to be drawn to him. In 1948, he took up residence with a woman in the San Fernando Valley, establishing a common-law marriage that would last six years. This woman had a ten-year-old daughter from a previous relationship, and it is believed that he preyed upon her, engaging in his depraved habits. He had a pattern of marrying young women with daughters, only to exploit them. In 1955, as Barbara prepared for her own wedding, Merds entered into matrimony for the fourth time, this time to a woman who had two children, including a young girl. In 1960, a tragic incident occurred when a 15-year-old girl, who often rode horses with Merds, was brutally stabbed to death, yet no one was ever implicated in the crime. Two years later, Merds wed for the fifth time, again to a woman with a young daughter. In 1964, he faced arrest for the molestation of a 14-year-old girl. Despite being suspected of numerous sexual offenses, this was the sole charge that led to his arrest. That same year, he appeared at a hospital with a gunshot wound, claiming it was an accident, though many suspected foul play. Investigators were unable to determine the shooter or the motive, but those close to him speculated it stemmed from his history of abuse and potential links to the murders of Barbara Jean Jepson and the 15-year-old girl. In 1965, following his arrest for child abuse, Murds underwent a polygraph examination concerning both murders. He denied any acquaintance with Barbara, yet it was later revealed that he had attended her funeral and maintained contact with her mother even after her tragic passing. Evans revealed that the results of the polygraph test indicated Mers possessed undeniable guilty knowledge concerning the tragic fate of the two murdered women. However, this evidence alone was insufficient for prosecution, as polygraph results are not recognized in court. As suspicions grew and the community began to sense something amiss, even Mers's own wife became wary. On August 15, 1965, she discovered the underwear of a young girl hidden in a drawer within their home. Confronting Murds about the disturbing find while he was out on bail, she questioned whether he had harmed the girl. This confrontation proved to be the tipping point. In a fit of rage, Murds seized a firearm and pursued Ina into the street, firing multiple shots that ultimately claimed her life. He then returned home and took his own life, marking a tragic end to his wretched existence. In a startling revelation in 2017, a former stepdaughter of Murs came forward with a harrowing account. On the day 15-year-old Pedrada was murdered, the then 10-year-old girl witnessed Murs entering the house, bloodied and wielding a knife. Paralyzed by fear, she held on to this traumatic memory for half a century before speaking out. It was reported that Murs subjected her to both physical and psychological torment, including a horrific incident where he stabbed her horse with a pitchfork. Now in her 60s, she confesses that the shadows of Merz's actions continue to haunt her. Further investigation by Evans uncovered a disturbing pattern. Merz never ceased his torment, even after remarrying or when his stepdaughters reached adulthood and left home. His abusive behavior persisted until his death. After extensive research, Evans managed to locate Merz's surviving relatives in Utah. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was executed on Merz's 87-year-old son, prior to the warrant's issuance. Detectives contemplated the exhumation of Merz's remains, 
yet they remained optimistic that the resolution of the case could be achieved through the collection of his son's DNA. Tragically, the son passed away merely two weeks after providing his genetic material to the investigators. While the DNA sample was insufficient for formal presentation, it yielded a significant match, establishing with 99% certainty that Mers was indeed the perpetrator of Barbara's murder. Furthermore, he was implicated in a series of other homicides and assaults, and had he been alive, he would have faced charges of first-degree murder. Regrettably, many individuals directly impacted by this heartbreaking crime have since departed from this world. On July 17, 1982, a chilling revelation unfolded in a serene meadow adjacent to Lake Tahoe. A woman was discovered lifeless, a victim of gunfire, near a well-trodden hiking path. Clad in shorts and a t-shirt with a bathing suit beneath, she appeared to have been preparing for a leisurely day by the water. Strikingly, she bore no identification. In a bid to unveil her identity, law enforcement disseminated numerous notices in local publications. They estimated her age to be between 25 and 35 years, standing at 5.5s with a delicate physique brown or hazel eyes, and brown hair styled in a bun. It was also noted that she had experienced childbirth and bore a vaccination scar on her left arm. Despite their efforts, no missing person reports aligned with her description, leading to her being dubbed Sheep Flat Jane Doe, named after the site of her tragic discovery. The evidence available to investigators was scant. They possessed what they believed to be a set of footprints belonging to the assailant, alongside DNA remnants from the scene. Faced with the dual challenge of identifying both the victim and the perpetrator, the investigation eventually grew cold. However, the Washoe County Sheriff's Office periodically revisited the case, seeking fresh leads and releasing various facial reconstructions in hopes of connecting with someone who might recall a woman missing from the summer of 82. In 2018, the investigation took a pivotal turn when authorities enlisted the expertise of Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, co-founder of the DNA Doe Project and founder of Identifinders International. This collaboration marked a groundbreaking moment as they employed genetic genealogy for the first time to unveil the identities of both the victim and the perpetrator in this long unsolved case. A dedicated team of volunteers, ranging from students to grandmothers, some with backgrounds in law enforcement, and others driven solely by a passion for genealogy, began their work. They initiated the process by uploading the victim's DNA to EDMATCH and organized themselves into smaller groups for a more focused approach. In a meticulous endeavor, each group delved into the intricate web of distant relatives, meticulously constructing family trees until they unearthed connections that revealed closer familial ties through shared DNA. Ultimately, they succeeded in identifying a distant cousin, leading to the long-awaited revelation of Jane Doe's true identity after 36 years. She was known as Mary Silvani, born in the charming town of Pontiac, Michigan, in 1948. Tragically, her father passed away during her high school years, while her mother had departed from the family long before. Mary had two brothers, and upon completing her education, the trio relocated to California. Remarkably, Mary had never been reported missing, and she was just 33 at the time of her untimely demise. Investigators discovered that there were no children linked to her records, suggesting the possibility that she may have placed a child for adoption at some point in her life. With Mary's identity established, Dr. Fitzpatrick's team shifted their focus to the pursuit of her murderer. Employing the same rigorous methodology, they dedicated 2,000 hours of investigative work, which led them to a potential suspect, James Richard Curry. It was revealed that Curry had taken his own life in 1987 while in police custody, following his arrest for the murder of three individuals in San Jose, California, a mere five months after Mary's death. Curry had been apprehended for the murders of a neighboring couple to whom he was acquainted. He confessed to the authorities and guided them to a storage unit he had rented, where they discovered the remains of a third victim, who had been reported missing for a year. Additional evidence within the storage unit suggested a connection to a co-worker who had vanished from Weaverville, California. Her remains were never recovered. 
Curry's life ended shortly after his arrest, as he committed suicide while awaiting sentencing at the age of 37. Notably, all of Curry's known victims were individuals he had known personally. His family indicated that he was well acquainted with the Lake Tahoe area, frequently visiting, though they remained uncertain if he had ever crossed paths with Mary. Investigators harbor the belief that further cases may eventually be linked to Curry.